Live from York, this is The Late Show with Christopher Valls. Good evening and welcome. Tonight we're going to be talking about teaching English in Australia with Joan Hillier. So join us as we explore the Australian state education system working with remote communities and the Australian post-colonial English curriculum. Live from York, this is The Late Show with Christopher Vowles on Teachers Talk Radio. Tune in live at ttradio.org or to join in the conversation, download the Podbean app and search Teachers Talk Radio. Follow the hashtag TT Radio. Tune in, talk it out with Teachers Talk Radio. Hello everyone and welcome to the Sunday Late Show, my first programme of the summer holidays. You join me at a crucial stage in the year when I'm about a tenth of the way through the domestic to-do list that seems to grow as soon as the last school task is crossed off of the list and I'm starting to think about what I can read to take my mind away from the classroom for a while. At the college, we're exploring ways of enhancing our students' capacity to read for pleasure. So I spent the first day of my holiday visiting a school in Birmingham, Hansworth Grammar School for Boys, to see how they do things. It was really pleasing to see the breadth of reading that their English students are engaged with, even in the dying embers of the summer term, and to see the Year 7 students happily discussing their reading with one another in their beanbag filled Skylab. Recent research from the Open University has again pointed to the positive effect that reading for pleasure can have on whole curriculum attainment. Yet in so many secondary educational settings, it seems that the entire burden for developing students' reading fluency and text acquired cultural capital still rests disproportionately upon English departments Departments which, of course, generally have two GCSEs worth of content to drive students through while addressing any literacy skills gaps that students arrive with after an unsuccessful or disrupted experience at key stage two. With reading for pleasure firmly in mind then, I spent most of my lunch breaks in the final fortnight of term making sure I personally read for at least 20 minutes in my teaching room, the common room or the library, and really pushed myself to read as much as I could at a decent pace in those weeks, including a blend of fiction and non-fiction. This time sat alongside the seven minutes of independent reading I do with each of my key stage three classes in lessons. Unsurprisingly, The result was that I was able to get through almost as much reading in these two weeks as I am able to complete in a typical holiday period. The non-fiction has included Tim Marshall's excellent geopolitical survey, text Prisoners of Geography and the Power of Geography, which detail the relationships between landscape, location and the rise of nation states. Philip Glass's memoir, Words Without Music, which provides the personal backstory to a musical career that has successfully supplied a demand from the cinema, the concert hall and the opera house for music without words. And Paul Mason's Clear Bright Future, which seeks to examine the implications of AI and machine learning for various aspects of our cultural, social, economic and political lives. The fiction mix has included Will Self's Dr. Mukti and Other Tales, which has extended my psychoanalytical vocabulary, William Golding's The Inheritors, an account of Neanderthal society's encounter with a new human species, presented by a narrator limited to a Neanderthalesque command of language, and Percival Everett's The Trees, an important fictional exploration of the very real atrocities associated with the lynching of black Americans, centered on the historical case of 14 year old Emmett Till, who was brutally murdered for supposedly offending a white woman in a shop by speaking to her. 
Of this list, The Trees is the only text I did not choose for myself. It was one of the books I receive each month as part of a bookshop contemporary fiction subscription, and one I probably wouldn't have read without being a book subscriber, as ever it is not an author I had previously encountered. Not all of the texts I have received via my subscription have been quite so memorable, but I wonder whether the concept of students making book picks for their friends might have some mileage in it, especially in the sick form, where a book exchange might be a nice addition to the boarding house secret Santa once we get towards December. So what have I learned from my reading for pleasure month so far? Well, that Saudi Arabia is the largest country on earth without a natural river, that Neanderthal life would probably have been more entertaining had they discovered metaphorical language earlier in their development, and that artificial intelligence either is or is not the harbinger of the fourth industrial revolution as we start to think about how we might employ it with appropriate regard to questions of ethics, authenticity and dignity. Tonight's show brings together issues of reading, technological teaching tools, and whose experience classroom texts ought to be representing as we take a journey into the Australian education system. So tonight we ask, what is the current state of the English curriculum offer in the Australian state sector? How are isolated communities reached in the context of a landmass that covers nearly 3 million square miles and stretches across three time zones? And how is English literature teaching in Australia changing as the country enters its 122nd year since its 1901 constitution was framed? We pose these questions, of course, in the same week that former Australian Prime Minister John Howard intervened in the important Indigenous voice referendum debate by declaring, I do not hold the view that the luckiest, sorry, I do hold the view that the luckiest thing that happened to this country was being colonised by the British. Not that they were perfect by any means, but they were infinitely more successful and beneficent colonisers than other European countries. <clears throat> the agreed wording of the voice referendum question is, Proposed law to alter the constitution to recognise the first peoples of Australia by establishing an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander voice. Do you approve this proposed alteration? The referendum vote is due to take place before the end of December this year, but with a yes vote requiring both a double majority of national votes cast and support from four out of six states, the Yes campaign have a very high electoral bar to meet. Polling is presently running at about 52% to 48% in favour of no, and we in the UK know only too well what issues such a split on a binary vote can present for a nation and its citizens in the aftermath of a constitutional vote focused on rights, national identity and representation. Joining me to discuss the educational, if not necessarily the political experience of 21st century Australians is Joan Hillier. Joan is a curriculum advisor for the Department of Education in New South Wales, Australia. Until this year, she was faculty head of English, HSIE and languages at Aurora College, the Department of Education's first public selective virtual school for rural and remote students. Joan has been a teacher, head of department and teacher educator for 27 years with experience in both rural and disadvantaged public schools, as well as three years as an associate lecturer at the University of Sydney. She spent 10 years as head of faculty in a connected school focused on Aboriginal education programs. Joan also maintains an active research interest in project-based learning, the development of teaching resources and mentoring programmes for beginning English teachers. And I'm pleased to say that Joan joins us on the line now from New South Wales, where, by my reckoning, it's a little after 5am on Monday. Good morning to you, Joan, and thank you for joining us on Teachers Talk Radio Good today. Good morning. Can you hear me okay? 
I can hear you loud and clear. Thank Fantastic. you. Fantastic. Look, I'm coming to you actually from a hotel room in Sydney because I'm doing a lecture at Sydney University this morning and um, up at 4.30 in the morning. So welcome to you, England. How are you? All right. I hope I've given my listeners an accurate <laughs> summary of your background. You have. You have. But is Thank there anything you so else much. you'd like to add? No, I think just that um, there are so many different educational systems in Australia, which I'm sure that we'll get to later, but the ones that you've talked about are ones that, qu that, that really specifically cater to uh, you know, very specific needs of certain communities. So, we'll, But apart from that, no, you've absolutely covered it beautifully. Thank you so much, Christopher. Fantastic. Well, in the first section of the show then, I'd like to look at the state education system in Australia, if we could, and the yeah. English curriculum in your state of New South Wales. Perhaps for the benefit of our listeners, Joe, and we could start with a big picture. What does teaching look like in the Australian public school system and how do things work? OK, well, teaching in the Australian public school system looks just as diverse as Australia does. I think that's probably the best way to describe it. Um, in the public school system, uh, we start from kindergarten, which is, you know, five-year-olds, uh, which I'm not sure what it is in um, England, but I think it's like prep or something. And then it goes all the way till you're 17 or 18 into year 12. And in the public school system, there are a couple of different models of education. So we have our selective schools and what they are uh, um, really probably the answer to private schooling, I suppose, <clears throat> where instead of sending the students off to private schooling, students who have particular um, interests and gifted and talented uh, sit at an examination and then they're, um, they're allowed to attend a selective school. So there are schools that are set up for those students. Uh, most public schools really, it works that wherever you live, your closest school is where you go. And so I think that that's probably the biggest disadvantage, I guess, in our schooling system is that you don't really have a choice so much. So if you are, you know, your local schools down the end of the street, that's where you go. And depending on the area of disadvantage, that can also then compound disadvantage, uh, especially since you have, you know, beginning teachers often who are sent to those schools with really little skills and knowledge. So, um, and not a huge amount of mentorship as well. So teaching an Australian public school system can be very, very difficult. Uh, depending on where you are. And I, I imagine it's very much the same where you are as well from a lot of teacher friends who have done the, the um, overseas experience. So that's that's a little um, overview of it. Is there anything else that you'd like to know about that, Christopher? Yeah, I think it's probably worth us exploring as well the, the nature of the state-based education system in yes, Australia. Because, absolutely. of course, in England, we have a nationwide agreement on what we're supposed to teach in our state schools. Right. So what we have here is a, an Australian curriculum. So that was that's only relatively new until probably about, or oh, maybe about 16 years ago, if I remember. <coughs> so I've been in this job for so long, I have to try and track back. Uh, probably about 16 years ago, an Australian curriculum was created because originally it was state-based curriculum, uh, which is very odd since, you know, we're federated in 1901, but still we all had, had to retain very strict and very different state systems. Then it was decided that Look, really, if you transferred from state to state, you could have an, a widely and wildly different educational experience. So the Australian curriculum was created. From there, though, the states did not want to give up um, their autonomy. So they were allowed to create a version of the Australian curriculum. So again, even though very broadly based, it's, um, it's similar. Uh, there will be variations across the states in the way that things are taught. So, for instance, uh, Victoria <clears throat> would, had originally a, a stronger focus on multimodal texts and uh, filmmaking, uh, whereas New South Wales was probably more literature-based and Queensland, again, may have had something a, a little bit different. So they had slightly different angles on the way that they taught um, the curriculum originally, and that's mostly been retained. So even though we do have an Australian curriculum, it is just a, a broad strokes, I guess. And how does the examination system fit into that model then, Joanne? Yeah, so the examination system is different state to state as well. So what we have is in New South Wales, where I am, we have the higher school certificate, so the HSC. Uh, there's a VCE in Victoria, and they're very different examinations. So for us, which I'll go into the exams um, in a little while, but 
uh, the examinations are a couple of um, different exams on on different novels and texts and, and different styles of writing and everything. Whereas in some states, it was a portfolio system where students had to create the work over the year, send in a portfolio, which was then marked as well as doing an external examination. So every single state has a different examination system. What they do retain that is the same is um, an ATAR, which is a tertiary rank that all students across Australia are ranked. And I don't know how it works. I'm definitely not a mathematician in this one, uh, where they're ranked ac according to their results so that they can access university in any state. But the school system itself and the examination system are quite different from each other. So over here in England, we have a series of different examination boards that are essentially national bodies that schools can opt into, but they can make their own choices. So is there one state assessment board for each state then? Yes, there is for each state. So <clears throat> we have the, um, we have like an education, um, educational board in each state, which are different, uh, but uh, they do talk to each other at some point. They'd have to really to make those, um, you know, decisions about um, university entrance. But no, there there are separate state boards, though. Yes, that's that's really quite a considerable difference for us then, because when we have departments sitting down trying to make decisions about which English syllabus to follow, for instance, well, to the exam at sixteen or the exam at eighteen, we don't have a huge number of choices, but we do it seems have more choices than is available to Australian schools in their states. I think we've got a choice about five or six examples, generally speaking. Well, so that the version of English we can choose to teach is largely determined by the syllabus we opt for. How does optionality work then within that single state okay. uh, assessment so regime? So the way that it works is because there are separate English courses, I suppose, and our our syllabus stays the same, uh, but the text that we select and the way that we deliver it is entirely up to the classroom teacher or to the um, head of faculty or however the school um, decides that they want to run it. So basically the syllabus that I have, for, let's say for year seven through to year 12, which is, you know, year seven is the beginning of high school and year 12 is the end. Uh, those sorts of decisions are made internally within schools. So the school can decide. We don't have other syllabuses that we can choose from, especially seven to 10, uh, but we do when it comes to year 11 and 12. So our senior schooling, you can choose to teach, um, you know, extension English, advanced English, standard English or English studies. So leveled syllabuses, depending on uh, the interest needs and ability of the students that opt for them. So that's where the choice comes in and the choice comes in in seven to 10 with the syllabus, with the order that you teach things and uh, what texts that you select for the, um, again, the interest needs and abilities of your own students. It's quite a bit of freedom there, really. Yeah, it's an interesting, it's an interesting model. Certainly when you put the two models side by side and think mm. about the differences that exist between them, what kind of place does English study have within Australian schools, would you say? Look, it's, it's absolutely central because it's compulsory. So it's one of those subjects, English is the only compulsory subject that students must do um, for their high school certificate. So that's why there's probably so many different levels of it. Um, regardless if you are planning to leave school and do a trade or whether you're planning to go to university and study literature yourself, there are you know four different levels realistically of English that you can do, but you must do it. So the only difference is the English studies course, which is the um, you know, less challenging course in some ways. Uh, you, it, it can come with a university entrance mark, but it doesn't need to. So it's just that you must do English and, and that would be the one that you would do if you probably weren't planning to go to university. But apart from that, it, it's um, mandatory. Um, it's now become quite linked to each other where it may have been that primary school was a little bit separate to what was going on in high school. The um, new syllabus, which has just come out to be implemented from next year, is every experience and every language, um, you know, connection to be made is made from kindergarten all the way through to year 12. And so it's a, a leveled and developmental syllabus that connects itself all the way through. So it is mandatory. It's, um, you know, I, I think the only thing that um, every single student needs to do. So it has absolutely a central place in the curriculum.
for, for English in Australia. So how does that sit next to maths then? Is maths not mandatory? Maths is not mandatory. So so how early could a child choose to give up maths as an examination a, subject? Oh, as an examination subject? Probably in year 11. I, they are changing it though to make maths mandatory as well within the next couple of years. Uh, but no, until now, uh, I'm saying probably next year, I think it is the next year's high school certificate because we're just having a syllabus change at the moment. Um, it will be mandatory for students to do some level of mathematics, but it was not mandatory. That, that would be mandatory to 18, would it? No, yeah, that would be mandatory to 18 until you leave school. But um, for myself, I didn't didn't do maths for the high school certificate. I did it till year 11 and then chose more extension English subjects. Uh, and there were a lot of students who just didn't opt into it at all. So you could absolutely technically, especially if you were very humanities driven, um, to do um, no mathematics for your high school certificate. So probably until you were about 16. So, you know, you have exams at 16. We used to. It was called the school certificate and that was dropped about, uh, I think, 10 years ago now, a little bit longer. Um, and instead was replaced with some literacy and numeracy testings that were standardised across the entire nation. So if we think about the exams, Australian students sit at 16 then, how many mm. subjects would comprise their certificate or group of qualifications? They don't sit any examinations anymore at 16. The only examination that they sit that is statewide, apart from uh, literacy and numeracy testing, which I'll get to in a minute, which is a national thing, uh, they don't sit any exams anymore at 16. It's all internal assessment. And that internal assessment mark goes to the Board of Studies and gets recorded only as a grade. And it's all determined in school. So the does only that, exam... Does that lead to a qualification then? Or is it no, it does just not. separate? Oh, it does. It's called a record of school achievement. And it is not exam based. But if they decide to leave school before they're 18, or before they're, they're finished school, 17 or 18, uh, they can have a, um, a testament that just has what subjects they sat and what grade they got but no other detail, and they only get that if they leave before they finish school. So, no, there is no qualification. that You can't leave school at 16 in Australia. You're only allowed to leave when you're 17, and if you do want to leave before that, you need to have a trade. You need to already be going to um, a technical college, so TAFE, um, or to be working more than 20 hours a week as well. So they changed the leaving age for students about 15 years ago as well, that you cannot leave school until you're 17 without jumping through a lot of hoops. Yeah, it sounds like we've moved towards a system more like that, actually. And one of the big questions we're thinking about over here at the moment is what is the future of examinations at the age of 16? Because mm. most of our students in England tend to sit between 7 and 11 of those subjects at 16. And if, if they're going to be required to stay on till 18, one, one wonders if you could do something more useful with the time than take out the whole of the summer term in your R, year 11. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And I think that that's, um, look, there, there was a benefit to it, I suppose, at some point, but really it was more um, at the time when a lot of students would leave. They'd leave when they were that age, they'd go off to technical college, they'd go off to work, they'd leave when they were 16. Uh, and then the students who were university bound usually would have stayed on and, and so forth. But now it's, um, you know, the curriculum is diversified so much. There's vocational education that's offered at school um, in combination with technical colleges. There's lots of things that have been put in place uh, to keep those students in school. And I mean, there are obviously political reasons for that. It, it would have been done some time ago to keep the unemployment rate down. So students were not out on the streets at 16, just, you know, doing whatever they liked, but they had to be in purposeful employment or purposeful study, otherwise they had to be at school. So I imagine that that was what it was for probably, um, you know, back in the day. But yeah, I, I do see your point though about uh, if all of them are staying on, though there is no point to that examination. But um, I think it was also only really for that sort of examination practice as well, I suppose. But but apart from that, um, yeah, no, it was a big change. It was a, It was a big change for us because we were teaching I suppose, towards that for so many years. And then it became a really different focus in our classroom of leading more into senior school. It's interesting as well, because I suppose it poses issues for accountability, because partly our students' results at the age of 16 are accountability measures for our schools and therefore, by extension, our teachers. Mm. Yes, well, let me tell you about the accountability measures, which are I, I know that they're the same everywhere. I've been watching 
um, news from around the world in, in all sorts of different teaching um, areas. And it's much the same. Our accountabilities um, come in different ways. But for us, there was a big shift when they introduced the standardised testing, which is called the NAPLAN um, you know, examination, which is the National uh, Literacy and Numeracy exam. And this standardised testing then became the thing by which our accountability was measured. And it's very contentious and still is. Uh, so students are tested in years three, five, six and nine on a national literacy and numeracy test. So even though we have our Australian curriculum and everyone ver it varies wildly, uh, we still you know, have this test. And what it's supposed to do is to create benchmarks um, you know, of what students can do and can't do. And for some time, the funding that schools received in uh, public education was tied to their NAPLAN results. So in terms of um, really looking at it in a kind of a deficit model, I suppose, that if students couldn't do things, then they obviously needed more help. So more funding, more teachers' aides were given to that school. And ironically enough, as soon as the results improved, when results were given to them, those things were taken away and then the results would fall again. So it was this um, you know, strange system. But what it's meant to do is to test um, language and literacy application across a full range of different you know, learning areas. So, you know, testing the reading of written English, you know, literacy, proficiency, language, language conventions and so forth. Um, and then the writing was really focused on curriculum English. So what was quite difficult, why it's so contentious is because firstly, language and literacy are across all subjects and it's written in all of our syllabus documents in every subject, not just English, that language and literacy are, you know, the responsibility of each subject. And yet English teachers were saddled with the results and head of departments like I've been for most of my career were asked to answer to those results. So very difficult when there are scientific, you know, you know, pieces of work that they're meant to interpret or something that's from geography and yet we were responsible still for the results. So that was difficult but also it's become over time more of a monitoring process. Um, looking at how schools and teachers perform, they started to publish them like league tables uh, on a website called My Schools website, which you could look at your school and how it had been performing over time. And anyone in the public can look at that. Um, so ironically, though, it this sort of national testing coincided with the decline in global performance in literacy. So it hasn't done what it was really sought out to do. It really... Um, you know, the, the arguments against it is it really narrows the strategies that you teach as well because you stop really teaching subject English syllabus and for those years you start teaching to the test because you are then, you know, monitored against it. So um, I think that NAPLAN has its place in some ways if it really is used to be able to identify gaps. So, okay, look, this particular school or these kids have real difficulty with writing a structured response or they have real difficulty with identifying you know, particular terms of grammar or whatever. But they're sort of, again, broad strokes, really. it's they, they do give very detailed information on each student and we can figure out and plug the gaps and figure out what's what they need help with. But when it's used as a, a league table, when it's used to put schools and teachers and classrooms again, competing against each other, it's not only not an effective tool, but it also does diminish the role and the importance of subject English by reducing it to a literacy ticker box measure. And what is the fail rate like for the national literacy test? It depends on socioeconomic areas um, pretty much entirely. So because I've been in mostly disadvantaged schools, but obviously I've worked at a university and I've uh, you know, travelled around to different schools and worked with lots of them in my role as a curriculum advisor as well. I can see, you can see from the results that it really is a measure more of um, socioeconomic disadvantage than it is a, of anything else. So the fail rate in those um, schools is quite high. So in some of the schools I've worked at, 50% of students would not meet national benchmarks in reading or literacy. Now, remember, I'm getting them in year seven and they've already had um, you know, you is three and five as well in, in primary school um, at being tested. Students in those schools as well and, and in most schools drop off quite sharply in year nine. So 
there's a few reasons for that. I think that like I've sat and I've, I've supervised that exam and I've seen particularly United boys will just, and this is not being stereotypical, it is statistical here, will just sit back in their chair and draw on the page and go, there you go, done. Just refuse to do it. They're not interested. They couldn't care less. It's very low stakes for them because it isn't tied to a qualification. It's just an NAPLAN. So what they did um, about a couple of years ago was they tied your U9 NAPLAN results to your ability to get a higher school certificate. So if you did not achieve national minimum standards, you could not get a higher school certificate qualification in year 12, even if you had improved significantly and uh, you know obviously passed that examination. So that was recanted after some time and became then still tied though to national standards. So you still have to complete uh, a national minimum standards in writing and numeracy um, to be able to qualify for the high school certificate. So they tried to, they've tried to do this sort of Frankenstein model of tying NAPLAN to HSC, even though they're very, very different beasts. One's a literacy and numeracy test and the other English test is essentially an understanding of literature test. So they don't really um, work together. They're very, it's very contentious. But yes, it really is, as I've said, tied to socioeconomic disadvantage more than anything. Great. Well, thank you, Joan, for giving us such a clear overview of the way the system works. In the next section of the show, we'll look at the theme of remote teaching, which I know you've been involved with extensively. I have, yes. And how this model serves remote communities. We'll be right back after this. Thank it's you. time for a fresh start to language learning. Pearson Edexcel's new student-centred French, German and Spanish 2024 GCSEs cater to the needs of all learners, regardless of their background, ability or reason for studying. Rooted in learned language knowledge, their assessments are transparent and accessible, allowing all students to showcase their language skills. Through inclusive and relatable content, the new Pearson Edexcel MFL GCSEs build a shared cultural capital that helps students develop an understanding of and appreciation for the wider world. Find out more at go.pearson.com forward slash MFL GCSE 24. This is Teachers Talk Radio, and this is Teachers Talk Radio News. BBC News website covers pressures being faced by providers of summer holiday clubs and activities as the rising cost of food drives down the value of support for pupils on free school meals. BBC News research shows that 67 of 92 councils have cut their support or kept it the same as last year, leading to a drop in value when food inflation, currently at over 17%, is taken into account. Across all four home nations, offers vary, but support has ended completely in Northern Ireland. In England, many councils offer vouchers to those eligible. The vouchers can be spent in supermarkets, but inflation means that the price of many foods has gone up. Further pressure has been added to families as those eligible are also finding it hard to access places on the holiday activities and food programme in some parts of England. The programme offers support with activities and food, but some providers say they don't receive enough funding to cover the increasing levels of need. One provider in West Yorkshire said they only got funding for 20 places, but had 70 children who would qualify on their waiting list. The news site further reports that a controversial decision to scrap free school meal help in Wales during the holidays could end up in the courts. The charity The Public Law Project is acting on behalf of a woman in Cardiff who says she and other families had no time to prepare for the short notice decision and that the government did not think about how to reduce the impact of the change made. The Welsh government insisted that the announcement made in March gave fair warning to those affected but a decision to reinstate the programme for the May half term appears to have caused confusion for many, as there was no clear announcement that this was the final extension of the scheme. The Guardian covers a report from the United Nations, which calls for a ban on smartphones in schools. UNESCO, the UN's Education, Science and Culture Agency, said there was evidence that excessive use was linked to reduce educational performance. It went on to suggest that high levels of screen time had a negative effect on children's emotional stability. UNESCO concluded its report saying, not all change constitutes progress. 
Just because something can be done, it does not mean it should be done. Referring clearly to the idea that technology as a whole, including artificial intelligence, should never supplant face-to-face -face interaction between students and teachers. The report said that countries needed to have clear objectives and principles to ensure digital tech in education was beneficial and avoided harm both to individual students' health and, more widely, to democracy and human rights. UNESCO did accept that online learning stopped education melting down when schools and universities closed during pandemic lockdowns, but added that millions of poorer students who lacked internet access were still left behind. Countries banning smartphones include France, which has had it in place since 2018, and the Netherlands launching a ban from 2024. Former Education Secretary Gavin Williamson called for bans in England in 2021 as part of a crackdown on poor student discipline, but he was criticised as failing to understand that schools had had policies regarding phones in place for years. In the USA, CBS News reports on changes to Florida's social studies curriculum for 2023. The news website states that the new curriculum will include lessons on how slaves develop skills that could be used for personal benefit. The lessons will be taught to students in 6th to 8th grade. They include teaching students on understanding the causes and consequences of the slave trade, the similarities and differences between serfdom and slavery, and the contact of European explorers with systematic slave trading in Africa. Vice President Kamala Harris voiced her opinions on the curriculum changes, calling them an attempt to gaslight us. Florida Governor Ron DeSantis dismissed Harris's criticism, and one of the co-authors of the new curriculum said, any attempt to reduce slaves to just victims of oppression fails to recognise their strength, courage and resiliency during a difficult time in American history. The new curriculum has been criticised heavily by many who see it as just another example of the conservative agenda which seeks to quash views not aligned with its own. Finally, Schools Week report on a police investigation into cyber attacks on exam boards Pearson and OCR, which led to the arrest of a 16-year-old boy. Both boards had exam papers extracted from their systems and sold online. The youth was arrested in early July on suspicion of theft, fraud, by false representation and computer misuse. He has been released on bail until early October. This has been your Teachers Talk Radio News with Joe Fox. This is Two Minute Tech with Steve Woods, your tech briefing on Teachers Talk Radio. Hello, over the next few episodes, I'm going to discuss connections. So let's get wired or not, as the case may be. The plan was to do this in order of most essential. However, a chicken and egg question came first. What is the most essential connection, the internet or your display device? Without the internet, there'd be far less interaction. However, how does this compare to the ability to display your screen to the class? I asked you on Twitter and at Elizabeth J. Rowan was a first First to answer with I'll hasten to add the most popular choice, the internet. There's 1001 ways to present or display information. I couldn't agree more. And talking of more, at more to learn, question my question, asking why do I have to choose? Showing the expectation we teachers have for both. However, when asked to choose, the answer was the internet and give me a whiteboard pen. So let's talk about the internet and the difference it makes to teaching we have a connection to the biggest network of networks at our fingertips indexed by powerful search engines that return results in seconds even ranking them in an order of likelihood of them containing the answer we are looking for obviously we need to swerve adverts and fake news from time to time but what a resource we have for those of us willing to admit they were around 20 years ago teachers were still transitioning from chalkboards every teacher was in the process of getting a laptop the projector was on a trolley you wheeled into the classroom and social media didn't exist. You couldn't just take a virtual tour inside a volcano or go on an interactive 3D journey through the digestive system, have a guided tour around the highly secure Google storage facility, drop a jelly baby on a map, walk around the coast of Spain, Italy or Australia. The internet has brought us all of this and harnessing, filtering and presenting its power to our pupils has become an art that we have had
back to master. So here are a couple of tricks you can use to keep yourself organized. Control plus D bookmarks a page. But did you know that if you make a folder of bookmarks, you can right click and open all. All of your bookmarks in that folder open as new tabs. This is great if moving from one lesson to another on a different topic. If you use a lot of YouTube clips and websites, Wakeless is a great way to organize collections of links and clips. It's free to make an account and you can share collections via links with pupils. I'd like to finish with a question. Do you know the difference between the internet and the World Wide Web? Tune in next week to find out. Why not get in touch? Follow us and tell us what you want to know about tech. I'm Steve Woods and that was Two Minute Tech. Two Minute Tech with Steve Woods. Your tech briefing on Teachers Talk Radio. Welcome back to our show on Teaching English in Australia with teacher, curriculum advisor and teacher trainer Joan Hillier. Joan has just given us an excellent introduction to the mainstream Australian school system, but she's also been involved with a series of fascinating projects that provide continuous online teaching for remote rural and Aboriginal communities. So how did you come to be involved with these projects, Joan? Okay, so I was a head teacher for a really long time. I'd worked in a disadvantaged school that was very challenging opposite a juvenile detention centre. And one day I'll come and have a drink with you, Christopher, and tell you some war stories, but not probably on the air. Uh, and after that, um, I moved out to a little country school working in um, you know, a central school. And that means that students go there from kindergarten all the way through to year 12 and have a really continuous education, but in a really small environment of only 300 students probably. And then from there, I, after going to university, I'd worked in at Tari High School, which was a connected communities school, and that's an Aboriginal um, you know, based school really. But I'm going to talk to you about the rural and remote teaching now because that's where it came after that. I thought, okay, well, I need a bit of a change. I've been a head teacher for most of my career by that stage and I wanted to diversify. After working during lockdowns, uh, during the pandemic, teaching digital, digital, sorry, digitally, I can't even say it at five o'clock in the morning, Chris. And um, I thought, look, I actually think I could do this. This might be something really interesting. And I came across Aurora College. What it is, is a dispersed model of teaching and leading where students are selected for as i said before the selective schools program you have to be of a certain um, you know ability level to be able to access it and you do an examination to get into it and yet these students are in rural and remote communities so for example you may have one really gifted student or really really talented student in a school like the the one i described at, at the central school who really has no um, no peers who are operating at the same level, doesn't really have sometimes trained teachers as well who are who have trained in gifted and talented education. And so what they can do is sign up for this Aurora College. It's a very unusual model, so I'm going to try and explain it to you. All of the students are sent out, uh, you know, devices. So they're sent out uh, laptops, headsets and, and so forth. So they've got the technology covered. Uh, they have a lot of to have tech support that's centered at Aurora College and they can call in and email in for any support they need with technology. And then they all meet in a class, a dedicated class with a teacher all at the same time. So it's synchronous digital learning. So whereas during, um, you know, the, during the pandemic lockdowns, we may have had Zoom calls with classes that were scheduled at certain times or, or um, whatever. In this way, they're all on the screen at the same time, but they are all coming from really, really different rural and remote communities. So in one of my classes, for instance, I may have had 15 students on the screen at one time and every single kid would be from a different area. Uh, so that was really, really interesting. I learned so much about my own country and about rural New South Wales as well. So um, they all worked with um, OneNote, so the program OneNote, and I could see when I'm teaching them what they were writing live in their workbooks, which was really fascinating. I could mark them as we went, I could correct them and discuss things as we went. So that's that worked in that's how that worked basically. And I was supervising as well 23 staff who were also um, you know in, in different remote schools. And the way that they that worked was that most of the teachers had a part-time load with Aurora and the majority of the load teaching face-to-face -face in their normal school. So they'd be teaching in their normal school and then they'd have a year seven English 
class for Aurora and they'd jump on at that time, teach for 100 minutes. It was very long lessons, um, teach online, mark their work online, deliver it all via, um, you know, lots of different technology, Adobe, Google Suite, however, through Jamboards um, and through, you know, de dedicated programs for, for teaching. So it was a very un unusual way to teach, but it really, really reached a lot of um, students across the state. Um, a very high level administration as well, believe you me, to be able to teach in that way. Uh, for year 11 and 12, it was different. These students in year 11 and 12, so for senior school, were not from the gifted and talented stream. So how that worked is, let's say you're in a central school out the back of nowhere, and I mean maybe 500 kilometres from Sydney, so quite a long way, and you're in this school and you're the only student in your school who wants to do advanced English or extension English or extension two. So extension two English is where you submit a 6,000 word creative writing piece or essay uh, that you work on for an entire year, like a little mini thesis. Um, some of those students are legitimately sometimes, I think I had one class, one girl who was one of three students only who was even completing the HSE in her school. And she would, you know, zoom into the meetings and we'd work together as an entire class. So she'd have this idea of an entire class of students that she's working with online that um, mostly never meet and um, would go back to her normal school during the rest of the time for her other subjects. So for senior students, it worked that they just, um, yeah, they didn't have to be gifted and talented. It just had to be that they had a particular need to study economics, English, whatever it was, and that we would deliver that live for them. So as opposed to distance education, which is send out a pack of work for you and um, check in with your teacher once a week, this was live synchronous lessons. So how would that work in preparing students for university entry then? Well, they do exactly the same examination. We just had to figure out different ways of delivering it. So we had, um, you know, they had normal examinations. We, st If we did examinations in English in HSC, it's very um, uh, determined what types of assessments you're allowed to give. So you are not allowed to give more than one exam. It has to only be the trial high, high school certificate and the rest are different types of examinations. So it could be a hand in essay or a multimodal presentation. They're all different things they have to do. So we have a pretty strict thing. We've still got to follow the same curriculum. Um, and for examinations, we have teachers within their schools who supervise them like a year patron or a year advisor who would supervise them writing their exams, scan those exams, send them to us in a digital delivery. We would mark them that way. And we'd mark them via a program called Canvas, which um, allowed us to make comments down the side, allowed us to mark up on the page and digitally send it back to students. Uh, in their own home schools, they would be delivered the high school certificate and monitored in exactly the same way as every other student in New South Wales. So we still prepared them in the same way. Uh, they got outstanding results um, and it really, really worked. Um, for, you know, for those students that I taught anyway, we had an amazing time. It was a very different um, way of delivery. And I'll talk to you a little bit about that, if that's okay. I just want to talk a bit about the sort of experiential learning in the classroom, teaching it remotely. So is that all right, Christopher, if I ramble on about that for a sec? Yeah, my next question was going to be, how did you alter the practice of your teaching as a consequence of the platform? Yes, that's what, yeah, sorry. Sorry, look, I'm already jumping ahead. Um, so how I had to do that was quite a challenge for me. I like a challenge, obviously, I've done all of these really different things, but I'm a very experiential teacher. So I'm the type of one who will dress up as a detective and come in and, you know, speak French to you when I'm teaching Edgar Allan Poe or something like, you know, it, it could be anything. Um, and I thought, how am I going to do these things if I'm teaching online? And I learned really, really different ways of delivery, ways of getting students to be interactive, not just in the chat in um, the program that we're teaching in, but, you know, like I said, using Jamboards, doing uh, virtual excursions, doing, um, you know, even going to the extreme, I'll tell you about in year 12, I'm teaching Jane Austen's Emma to my class and I we held a Regency high tea online. So I posted them and I mean, it took weeks sometimes to get to these kids. So I had to make sure that they were shelf stable, little cakes and little, um, you know, things of tea and whatever. And it went to all of them. They all had to open it at the same time. They all had to either dress up or have a, a background, you know, create a virtual background that represented um, that time period. 
we held a um, you know, like I said, a Regency, Regency high tea. We were doing it using all of the rules of, of a high tea. We were looking at the history behind this. We were um, playing virtual Regency games of trying to match make people and things. So basically I just had to figure out in my home school at Tari High School, what I would have done there was I had a Jane Austen incursion where we had a picnic and we did all of these different things. So I had to figure out how am I going to do this? Um, online. So we did that with lots and lots of things, um, uh, a lot of play-based things, a lot of collaborative documents. Uh, I learned how to um, have students write a collaborative essay where one person would write a, a thesis statement and the others had to either contribute to it or edit somebody else's and it was all going live. They all had a different colour that they were typing in and so we could all see who was saying what and when. So it was really, um, really unusual. I just had to find different platforms and different ways of doing it. Um, but keeping that interactivity was really important to make them feel that they had um, not just a buy-in to what they were doing, but also to create that sense of collaboration and um, team building, I suppose, uh, with students who weren't seeing each other in real life. So, yeah, look, uh, finding the ways of teaching experientially was one of my greatest joys really at Aurora because it was um, fun for me. It was really interesting for them. Um, presenting things to each other all of the time as well. You know, okay, go away and present, to, you know, create this presentation, this multimodal presentation, and then you teach the class and you work with them. And so um, having them understand the technology a lot better than I did when I first came in there was um, quite fun. They were very, very kind. And year 11 especially were always like, oh, miss, you're on mute, or you haven't done this right. And there were definitely some stuff ups along the way at all. Um, briefly, I know we don't have a huge amount of time here. I'll tell you one of them. I was sharing with them a, a little video on someone who was deaf and had all of a sudden, um, you know, had an operation, was able to, to um, hear again and then could hear all the nasty things her family was saying about her. And the class watched it and they said, oh, Miss, that was just so profound. She really couldn't hear anything. And we had the same experience of what it was like to be deaf. And I was like, what are you talking about? And they, they, then I realised I had not shared sound and even though she could hear everything halfway through, my class could not. So they just thought that I was being particularly um, meta there and giving them something, um, you know, where someone was entirely deaf and they had that experience. But I learned the hard way with technology there. But definitely, um, you know, experiential teaching was one of the greatest joys of learning how to do that for geographically scattered populations. It sounds like you gained a lot from the experience yourself as a teacher. Um, and... This second project that you've been involved with, the one that involves teaching virtually and bringing students together physically on an annual basis. Are you able to say a little bit about that for us? Yes, absolutely. So that same school, um, Aurora College, twice a year, the students from um, year five, because they have um, an opportunity class as well for um, students who are in primary school. So from year five through to year 10, they're not the seniors, they were off doing senior things in their own schools as well, so we couldn't take them away, uh, would meet twice a year on in a central location for a week-long camp, which we called residential school. And they had lessons in person with their class. They uh, went on excursions to different areas. They had e expert guest speakers come in and workshops. And it was pretty full on, I'm telling you now, for 500 students or, or close to 500 students for a week with all of us teachers as well. The organisation that that takes, there is a full-time role in the school for the organisation of residential camp because we are having students fly in and bus in uh, from all over um, New South Wales, the furthest reaches, and even from Norfolk Island, which is still part of New South Wales, even though it's an island. So you have all of these, um, you know, planes coming, teachers waiting at the airport to greet all of the students. You have uh, buses legitimately, I think it's about 20 buses that are going on these inland routes, picking up students along the way, and then meeting either in Canberra or in Katoomba or you know, all of these really um, different places or in the middle of Sydney so that no one's particularly disadvantaged of being too, you know, further away than anyone else. They change it up every year where they're holding it. Um, but that was pretty amazing. We, um, these, and that, these students form very, very strong bonds. They spend a week with each other twice a year and some of them are going through schools, you know, from year, year five all the way through to year 10 with Aurora and seeing these um, people. And I know for a fact that some of my year 12 students who went through the whole system um, would travel 
vast distances to spend with each other in school holidays. So my year 12 boys all got together to have um, a, a big watch party of watching as many versions of Emma as they could find in the school holidays. And they lived, some of them, 600 kilometres away from each other. Wow. So it really brings together a fairly intense process, I would imagine. Oh, absolutely. It is very, very intense and it's exhausting, uh, but the kids get a lot out of it. And, um, you know, I've seen, it, you know, students, especially with, um, you know, sometimes we have twice exceptional students, so students who have some sort of, um, you know, you know, different, who are differently abled in some way or are high, high functionally autistic, lots of different students come together. And I've seen, um, you know, the way that, you know, that sort of diversity is really embraced at Aurora because students who are often very gifted often have, you know, other um, concerns that they need to deal with as well. We have a lot of, um, you know, different gender identifications. We have a lot of students who, um, you know, think very, very differently, are really um, absolutely incredibly gifted musicians and things. And I look at that residential camp when I knew I was really in a very different world to the very disadvantaged schools I'd been in was when I walked in one day to the hall and someone pulls out their cello, someone else gets on a piano, someone else gets out a violin and they just played. And it was one of the most amazing experiences walking into a, a dining hall where kids are just getting together jamming but playing their classical instruments. It was pretty amazing. It was a pretty special moment. And um, the same as teaching um, my year 12 students. It was somebody's birthday. And one of the boys who's a concert violinist gets out his violin somebody else gets out their guitar and they sang happy birthday to her online and someone else lit a candle. And it was, um, you know, this sense of camaraderie and uh, specialness about what they do and being really rural and remote um, was, was lovely. And, and again, that diversity, one child's showing me pictures of piglets that were just born on his farm and somebody else is telling me about the, the violin that he's playing. So very diverse um, students who all come together um, with their, because of their great love of learning. Is this a model that you think could work elsewhere in Australia or wider even than Australia? Yeah, absolutely. I do think that um, the reason why I did it after after COVID as well, I thought I can really see the not just the potential of this, but I can see how this is an alternative model for some students as well, especially in geographically diverse areas, but also students who have particular needs or interests rather than sending them a package of work to complete or dialing in like it used to be in Australia School of the Air where you just would f listen to a radio thing you know of, of classes a long time ago uh, this is a really um, interactive way of doing it yes of course there are issues with that if, if socialization and so forth but in this model they're still they're not connecting from home they're not allowed to they connect from a school so they're still in their home school so they still have recess and lunch and before and after school with all the other kids they just go into the library or whatever and they go and connect to um, to their Aurora lessons. Now, Aurora is not every subject. It is English, um, maths and science for year 7 to 10. And for higher school certificate, it's just whatever subject you opt into. So there, there, there needs to be a really good balance there, I think, between um, socialisation and connection um, and this model. But I do think absolutely it could work elsewhere. It's just been expanded Aurora for gifted and talented Aboriginal communities. And so this year we have our first, um, they have their first group in year five and six joining from remote parts of New South Wales, um, Aboriginal students only in a class together, being taught with culturally sensitive and appropriate materials at all times. Fantastic. We're going to move on to the Aboriginal topic mm. um, after the next break. So we might just hold yep. on to that one for a moment. Yep, no worries. Um, again, I've, I'm going to ask that boring question that all government mm. departments are interested in, which is accountability measures. If you've got students sitting um, lessons in one school mm. while actually attending a different school, how does that work? Yeah, look, it's an incredible feat of administration, which is probably the killer for me really in this um, but. We need to be incredibly accountable. So everything is, like I said, digitally, not only digitally stored and recorded, every lesson's recorded as well. So that was kind of confronting when you're having a very bad hair day and you have to be recorded in front of your class, but you are being recorded every lesson. So every lesson I delivered was recorded. 
life and then stored. Every single lesson was then also put into a student's term planner so they could click back on that lesson and rewatch it. Uh, you have, um, like I said, all of your normal assessment procedures that follow the same as every other school. And you have to have incredible communication with the other school as well. Here's the results that they're getting here. We sometimes also helped those schools if they would say, look, Aurora's getting amazing results in this particular course. We're not so much in our school. What are you guys doing? And so we would collaborate with them as well. So the accountability is extreme in Aurora. It is more than any school that I've ever been in. The record keeping has to be um, precise. And so does, um, like I said, every recording of every lesson, every assessment task, every assignment, every piece of classwork stored digitally as well in OneNote. And they're all um, accessible to our senior executive. And at any time, obviously, they could be... Um, you know, you can be audited as well. So you can have to uh, have all of those things ready. So the accountability is extreme in that school. So is there a national body responsible for auditing or inspecting schools then? And if so, how, how do they assess that stuff that's online separate from the physical stuff? Yeah, well, they just would be get granted access to it, but it's nothing like in, in, in England with your inspect, in, you know, inspection system. This is more like you would get be given notification that um, a particular subject is going to be audited in your school and then it would be they would be granted access and they would just have to make sure that you are completing so all of the teachers programs have to be you know signed off by their head teacher or head of faculty in, in Australia it's called and um, by the deputy principal and the principal they have to make sure that all of those things are complete they're just stored and then if anyone comes to um, you know, inspect it. They just go through and make sure that all um, assessment tasks are being done according to the way that they're meant to be done, that all students have already had those schedules given to them, that uh, all lesson plans are there and those sorts of things. It's just really um, a ticker box almost. And if there's a problem, it's not um, that you are hugely punished. It's just, look, here's the things that are missing. These are the things that you need to address. And you're given time to address them and then they come and check it again. So that sort of national body um, does exist, but in nothing uh, like the rigor, I would say rigorous and probably quite excessive in some ways that what's happening um, in the UK from what I've heard. And um, not, nothing like some no inspectors going to walk around to make sure I have my learning intentions on the board, put it that way. So it's not, um, not, not to the extreme, it's just more like a you know, an overseeing and a checking process rather than um, something that's punitive. It all sounds quite humane to me. A little bit, yeah. Well, I'm sure that we are probably moving more towards, it's become more and more administratively heavy, but it really is um, mostly the responsibility of schools. So it has that hierarchy, as, as you know, like we have um, a principal, a deputy principal, and then head teachers. So I know that head teachers are what, our principals in in the UK, but um, a head teacher is just head of faculty. So sometimes you're head of a few faculties, but you're ultimately responsible for the staff under you. And then your deputy principal, you usually have a line manager, and they check um, to make sure that those processes. And Aurora's was quite extreme. Like I said, every term, every class, every teacher had to have all of these things, making sure that they were all all in order. Because you know it's a special school. It's you know, above establishment, it's being funded by the department. So it is quite, um, you know, administratively heavy and very a lot, little bit more scrutinised probably. But in a regular school, I would just have a folder of all of the things that I'm ticking off to make sure that I've seen them. And basically my word's good enough. If, me, if I as a head teacher have said, yes, this is there, yes, I've seen their program, yes, I've seen this, um, then that's, that's, that's usually good enough. It would only be if I was audited that I'd need to actually produce those things to show that they were there. So Aurora in that way has an advantage because everything's already digital, it's already stored, it's already there. There's no, oh no, I lost the folder and where is that piece of work? It's already always there because it's delivered online, it's administered online and it's programmed online. Well, it sounds like a fascinating model for educational technology being put to good use. It sounds too like it's stretching your teacher's abilities to do new things technologically to get students to build relationships both online and offline in the real world. Um, it sounds like something that's really quite innovative, but innovative in a really, really positive way. 
Yeah, look, I think it's incredibly positive. I think that um, probably, you know, it does have out in the real world of teaching, of course. So there's a lot of complaints by other teachers who are, who are like, oh, but you don't have to do playground duty, but you don't have to deal with some crazy child that's, you know, smoking under the demountables and you have to pull them out or something, like, you know, all of those difficult things, uh, which is true. It is an oasis in that way of teaching. The students want to be there. They love it. They're all really great kids. That's the positive. But on the flip side of that, no, I don't have to do playground duty, but my administration would be triple because of, uh, you know, that sort of level of accountability and because it's a dispersed model. I can't just say, it's basically like you're dealing with 100 different contexts. If you have 100 kids that you're teaching over the course of that year, there are 100 different contexts. They're not all in the same school. So you are dealing with all of those other schools as well as Aurora internally as its own school. So it's quite um, administratively heavy. But apart from that, yes, the model itself is not just a fascinating one, but one that really does work for the students and stretches the teacher's ability to teach in different ways, but also to keep, I suppose, upping the ante as well. You've got gifted and talented kids who will never just be satisfied with, um, oh, well, that's the answer, or it's much more inquiry-based learning and much more um, about interrogating uh, what, they're, what they're studying, which I think is a really valuable skill for all students going forward into the, um, you know, into the coming years. Excellent. It sounds, again, like a really, really useful project to be involved with. I wonder if we might, in the final section of the show, return to some of those questions of Australianness that I hinted at in my introduction and consider the evolving place that English study has in a post-colonial Australia. Mm. Absolutely. We'll be right back after Thank this. You. It's time for a fresh start to language learning. Pearson Edexcel's new student-centred French, German and Spanish 2024 GCSEs cater to the needs of all learners, regardless of their background, ability or reason for studying. Rooted in learned language knowledge, their assessments are transparent and accessible, allowing all students to showcase their language skills. Through inclusive and relatable content, the new Pearson Edexcel MFL GCSEs build a shared cultural capital that helps students develop an understanding of and appreciation for the wider world. Find out more at go.pearson.com forward slash MFL GCSE 24. Welcome back to the final part of our discussion on Australian education with Joe and Hillier. We've talked about mainstream Australian state education as a system, and we've explored the imaginative ways in which online teaching has helped to reach those communities unable to access mainstream state schools and to extend themselves in terms of gifted and talented students. I wonder if we might close by thinking about what role an English curriculum can play in a post-colonial Commonwealth country that's reassessing its relationship with the UK following the end of the second Elizabethan era that is much more demographically diverse than it has been at any point in its history mm. and that has begun to establish an Australian canon that is now able to draw on the work of some exceptional 20th century writers. Multiculturalism is now a demographic fact in 21st century Australia. So how are English curriculum leaders and classroom teachers responding to this new reality, Joan? Okay, well, I think that um, we've been doing this for a really long time, I suppose. I think that when um, we talk about it in terms of, you know, multiculturalism, we've been a multicultural society really for a really long time since our you know first custodians of the land, our Aboriginal people, all the way through to all the different waves of immigration. But in the actual syllabus itself, probably again about 10 or 15 years ago, it, it was starting to really mandate the sorts of things that we needed to, to cover. So it was, thing, it was things like, you know, making sure that you had, you know, a range of texts by Aboriginal authors, a range of texts from different parts of the world. In the last syllabus iteration, it had that it was mandated as well that we taught texts um, from Asia and from Australia's Asian neighbours. So that was a, a new thing that we really had to come to terms with. 
the new syllabus that's coming out, I'm just going to give you a little list of here are the selection of texts that we must cover. So we have to cover a range of fiction and nonfiction texts that are regarded as quality literature, and that can come from anywhere in the world. But we must also do a range of texts by Australian authors. And that's not just talking about classic, um, canonical Australian texts. So it can be uh, very contemporary ones as well. And that seems to be the thing that I've seen the most probably in my career that has probably changed. So whereas we would have mainly done a handful of, you know, American texts probably in junior years, so To Kill a Mockingbird and The Outsiders and all the traditional sorts of things like that, um, you know, through to probably some more popular young adult texts that were coming through. And then also balancing that mainly with still the, the canon really. And having said that, we would touch on Aboriginal authors. We would occasionally do some Aboriginal poetry uh, and so forth. But in the last iteration of the syllabus and the current one, the last one asked us to consider Aboriginal texts that they must be done. The next one, which is starting next year, is not just considering Aboriginal texts, but a range of texts by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander authors. So no longer can a teacher just do a novel about Aboriginal people or an essay written by someone about Aboriginality. They must do them written by Aboriginal authors. And so that really has, um, you know, opened up, you know, new ideas for teaching there. But we still have this range of quality texts from around the world. So texts about intercultural and diverse experiences. So it can be literature about authors with diverse backgrounds and experiences, including disability. So and then cultural, social, gender perspectives, youth perspectives. These are things that are mandated in our syllabus. So a multicultural society really fits really well, well with that. One of the um, things, though, as I've said before, is that those texts that are selected are determined by the school. So it really depends on what your the environment that you're teaching in. And in a country schools, mostly, I will have a regular, you know, Caucasian group of people who are, you know, lower middle class. Like It's a really different um, perspective where I would have had maybe one legitimately one Asian student in my school. Whereas if I'm teaching in Sydney or in Southwest Sydney, I'll have a much bigger uh, multicultural um, perspective. And it's not to say that the students in our lower middle class white schools in the country shouldn't have access to those texts. Uh, they absolutely should and they should be given experience of it. But what's really important in Australian schools is that concept of representation, of making sure that we are representing the students that are in front of us so that they are seeing themselves or versions of themselves in the writing that, that's being presented to them. And then they're not being given, as we were saying in a post-colonial, I guess, you know, Australian world, that we're not just giving them what's traditionally considered the canon. But um, even then, we still need to consider, we have on our mandated list at least one work of Shakespeare each um, every two years. And if you do advanced English for the HSC, that is still mandatory. So we still have, um, you know, quite a lot of canonical texts as well. So I think it's actually just hitting a right balance at the moment. I think that in our um, multicultural society, it's responding to that demographic fact by either really um, catering to particular groups within your own school context or striking that balance between all of the texts that are on offer for us. But what we're definitely moving away from, I think, is, well, there are often, as I've said to you before, there are always debates, there's this evolving debate about what English means and what, um, you know, what subject English means. And there's, I think the, the new syllabus is really trying to strike a balance between literature of all types at its core and language and literacy, which are, um, you know, surrounding that. But I yes, think that it, if we think about literature, there's that potential curse, isn't there, that Australia would have to confront in the same way that Canada might have to confront and Australia, mm -hmm. sorry, America, um, New Zealand, some parts of India where you're working with a language which is English, but it's an English that is unique to the context of your particular setting. Yeah, absolutely. And some of that you'll see some of the youth texts that the sort of young adult fiction is very much um, contextual. So if I if I was to take some of these young adult novels to you right now, you'd probably you'd understand it, obviously, because it's English language, but the context would need unpacking. Much the same way that for Australian students doing something that is set in England, 
or set in America will also need that sort of context unpack unpacking. But yeah, absolutely. It's um, an evolving idea of language, I suppose, as well, and the way that language represents us. And um, in all our syllabus documents as well, it has always that, um, you know, Aboriginal English as well is a, is a uh, accepted form of English and that that must be accepted. So, and what we mean by that is that, um, you know, writing in, um, you know, sometimes conflated sentences or writing in different ways needs to be respected as well. So I think it's, um, that yeah, we, I don't, don't necessarily think we're moving away from, uh, you know, British writing or from US writing or anything else. But I think that we're just finding our own voice within it and combining all of those things to have a really good balance so that we represent the people in front of us, but also that so that we give them a broader worldview. So sometimes teaching a, a text that's written in India, for instance, um, might not be something that I would naturally choose because I am a white middle class woman living in the suburbs. Okay. But there will be students in that class who are, who would benefit greatly from seeing a different worldview from the one that's presented to them around their dining table as well. So I think that, um, that that's also a balance. What we're really moving away from though, and what all of the debates that are coming to Australia are really quite close to the ones in the USA about the sort of cultural heritage sorts of models and making sure that we're not just teaching, you know, stories of the white savior, like to kill a mockingbird or, or things that are sort of, very typical in our schools, but really look at um, at the way that you know literature represents us as a society, and really thinking about those sorts of ideas. So I think that um, there's a shift at the moment culturally everywhere in the world, uh, but I think honestly, it's a, for me personally, it's entirely about striking a balance in our curriculum of making sure that we're representing people, um, but also not giving them what they see in their normal world all the time. I think it's the teacher's responsibility, the English teacher's responsibility to disrupt their world. And I really like um, the idea that good literature disturbs the comfortable and comforts the disturbed. And it's something that I use all the time as a premise for selecting texts myself, that we need to still shake up our own worldviews sometimes to consider the worldviews of others, even if we return to our own in the end. If we take that idea and apply it to contemporary Aboriginal writing that's coming through, mm. how is that being presented to students in classrooms? Because one imagines it could be quite disturbing, particularly for the younger generation. Yeah, I think you have to be very careful about your text selection, but a lot of um, things are told quite sensitively in terms of, we use a lot of verse novels that are written by First Nations people uh, that still touch on um, some of the traumas of the past, but what we really need to be careful about is about uh, presenting a deficit model of Aboriginal communities, that this is only about trauma, this is only about um, terrible background, this is only about these things. It also needs to be balanced with showing the success of Aboriginal people and um, also their great creative um, abilities as well. So I think that, again, it needs to be that idea of striking a balance. I definitely wouldn't be, um, you know, showing junior students, um, you know, something really, really traumatic. But I think it's something that is part of our nation's history and it's and learning about stolen generations and learning about um, Aboriginal history and um, culture is something that is embedded and mandatory in our syllabuses from kindergarten. So by the time they get to, you know, year nine and 10, um, learning about those sorts of ideas of displacements and, dis and being disenfranchised is something that comes into our history syllabuses as mandated, that's in our English syllabuses, in science, learning Aboriginal science technologies, everything. It's, it's just so embedded throughout, I think, that students... Um, you know, are usually not okay with it, but are okay to confront it by the time it comes to the more serious um, topics that they, they really need to think about in senior years. And how are Aboriginal students nationally performing in subjects like English in Australia? Yeah, not particularly well. And it's something that um, is trying to be addressed, well, has been addressed, I suppose, over time, but really in those junior years especially, look, I looked up some statistics on this just to be able to talk to you about it, but 41% uh, of Indigenous kids are considered developmentally vulnerable. And if you're in a really remote area, that's two times more likely to develop that sort of, um, they've got language and cognitive um, skills are quite low. Um, 
but other things, skills in being able to connect with people, skills in being able to understand um, relationships, all of these sorts of things are, are higher. So there are different things going on there. What's um, how it's been made to address here, how we've made, be, how we've been addressing it again, as I said, is making sure that that cross um, key learning area content is all the way through, but not just Aboriginal perspectives, which is something that we do make sure that we um, cater to. It can really be though a bit of a ticker box um, thing sometimes where people go, oh great, okay, I've done Aboriginal poetry, move on. I think the new syllabus is trying to address that by making sure that the voice that we hear is not uh, somebody else's idea of co-opting Aboriginal um, experience and explaining it in literature, but literature by Aboriginal contemporary authors, um, which again, like I said, is not always a deficit model. It's not always talking about trauma. It's just relationships and life and um, normal teenage stories. Uh, one of the ways that it's trying to be addressed, I think, has been quite successful, especially in country areas, is um, there's a uh, thinking model called the eight ways of Aboriginal learning. And you can Google that yourself. You'll find it. It's very interesting. And if you teach using knowledge systems of Aboriginal people rather than Aboriginal content, uh, this is where students um, succeed. So things like making land links, for instance, it could be, all right, so I'm talking about something. I, I will refer to a, a local mountain or a riverway or something to try and explain a topic or uh, spending time in a lot of time in discussion rather than here's your worksheet, go and fill it in. So learning different ways that Aboriginal students tend to um, work better has improved their results. And in HSC results, uh, definitely we've retained a lot more Aboriginal students than we ever have before by trying to close the skill gap as well. As well. Some of the schools I've worked in, the Connected Community School, an example um, there of showing that great appreciation of our First Nations people is that they've revived local languages because when they were, um, you know, during the stolen generations, they were told they weren't allowed to speak their own language when they were put into um, reserves or missions. And so this um, local language has been revived, is taught in technical college, and is also the only language that is taught apart from English in uh, the school. So instead of European languages, where we would normally, for languages other than English, be teaching um, you know, French and German and so forth, that was abandoned in that school and they only teach Gatang, which is the local language. And you have elders come in and teach it to the students and that is the only language other than English that they learn. So doing things like that, reviving those things has made a massive difference to the students in that school and um, in other schools where they are incorporating not just Aboriginal perspectives, but also the eight ways of Aboriginal learning as well. So, but in general, um, Aboriginal, I wouldn't call it Aboriginal communities. I think it's just people from Aboriginal background. Uh, they're the same as every other student, have the same expectations, the same examinations. There's no, um, you know, concessions made because you're Aboriginal. But what um, is done is really that any sort of skill gaps that are there, they have some sort of different interventions, sometimes Aboriginal tutors, and um, there's often an Aboriginal resource centre or hub in most public schools where you will where it will have an elder in residence, so an Aboriginal elder, Aboriginal um, you know support workers as well, and so forth to have that sort of home base hub within the school for Aboriginal students for culture and also for um, any extra learning needs that they might have. So that's how it's addressed at the moment. Um, it's still a long way to go. And for those students that aren't located in cities or urban areas, how does education reach them? Not well. Um, I think that um, there are huge, especially in the Northern Territory, they've, they try really, really hard the, the, to put all of these different programs in place. They've been doing Closing the Gap programs for years and years and years and has had marginal success. And I think the reason why most Aboriginal um, elders will say is that they haven't had um, a, a space at the table to make those decisions. So you have local Aboriginal land councils which do have a say in education, but really the people who are often the decision makers are not the Aboriginal people themselves. And so it's that sort of um, you know paternalistic sort of idea still that is a hangover from colonial times of saying, oh, we know what would work here. For these Aboriginal people and putting those programs into place. 
So um, going back to your very beginning statement about the referendum, I'm happy to talk a little bit about that politically in that what the idea is, and I don't think it's been particularly marketed very well or understood very well, but what the idea is, is that Aboriginal people will then have um, you know, constitutional right to have a say in things which directly affect them. But of course, it's been marketed by you know, very conservative groups of saying, oh, well, what that really means is that these Aboriginal people will come and take your land back. It, it, silly, like, you know, really making these huge, you know, huge leaps of logic. Um, but if Aboriginal people do have a seat at the table and can speak to things which directly affect them, like education, then hopefully um, we'll be able to see that sort of change in that system. Because at the moment, especially in remote communities, um, it's very much, you know, a hit and miss. And I think that um, it's, this is by no fault at all, please don't think I'm saying that, no fault at all of um, the people who are working tirelessly in those communities. But I just think that um, there's always something more that can be done. I, th I think that there's been improvements over time. I think that by having these sorts of um, things like the Aurora program for um, Aboriginal students as well, being able to call in and have, you know, really dedicated lessons uh, that are having really high expectations of them and expecting them to turn up on time and expecting them to be in class or, um, and a really great community online of other kids who are also on different country, different Aboriginal areas, but also um, together want, wanting to succeed and wanting to learn. I think it's a really great model, but really, um, you know, it's disadva economic disadvantage as well, as I've said to you the entire way through this, um, is one of the biggest markers of success. And some of our Aboriginal people, especially in the most remote communities, have the, some of the highest levels of, of disadvantage um, in the country um, economically, which always translates into schooling experience. What about Aboriginal teachers? Do we have enough teachers in Australia from Aboriginal backgrounds? We do. We have a lot of um, special programs as well, which do allow Aboriginal teachers into um, the system with scholarships, with uh, you know support at university to help them get through university as well. Because there's a lot of cultural capital missing a lot of the time when we have Aboriginal um, students enter the teaching profession. I've worked with amazing Aboriginal teachers, especially in connected community schools. But we do have uh, identified Aboriginal teacher recruitment as well. So certain positions, you can say in your school, this is an Aboriginal identified position, that I want an Aboriginal teacher in this school and only Aboriginal teachers can apply for it. So that has definitely, um, you know, been a focus of the Department of Education. Obviously in private schools, very different, but I've always been and always will be a public school teacher. Um, it's something that I believe in really strongly being um, a product of it myself uh yeah and so anyway i think that that's um definitely good in terms of representation as i've said before that having representation in texts but having representation in, in form of a live teacher in front of you is really important to to aboriginal students and I, and I don't want to talk about it in so much as a deficit model of aboriginal students because i have seen enormous successes as well um brilliant things come out of my classrooms and i'll um, finished with one. Um, she did make me take it down off Twitter because she said this is our story and, and I shouldn't be telling it in that way. But um, one of my beautiful students from when I first started teaching, her artwork was um, illuminated on the Harbour Bridge recently because she went from an extremely disadvantaged background to a very difficult life to being an incredibly successful artist, speaker and um, Aboriginal worker for a really, really long time. And so she had a terrible start to life and I remember it very distinctly, but I won't talk about it publicly, but she um, has been very successful. And there's so many of those over my teaching career that I don't really want to think about um, Aboriginal people in a deficit model. I just think that there needs to be more support, more Aboriginal voices at the table. And, um, you know, so that, that sort of idea of self-determination can really be fully realised. Fantastic. So that's an excellent point for us to close on, Joe. And it's been really, really good hearing you talking about your career, your experience, both in physical schools and in remote schools, and indeed 
the wider cultural issues that are at play at the moment in Australia. Thank you very, very much indeed for being so generous with your time so early in the morning today. That's quite all right. My poor husband, we're in a hotel because as I said, I'm staying in Sydney today and going to um, Sydney University to do a lecture for a couple of hours there. And he's um, trying to sleep, so <laughs> I'll go now. <laughs> but that's all right. Thank you so much. We've covered some excellent ground together and your account of the virtual schooling experience in particular has mm. certainly challenged some of my COVID acquired jadedness perhaps about how we reconnect with the disconnected. I wish you, your students and your colleagues every success for the rest of the term. And I'm very, very grateful for your time this morning. Thank you very much indeed. No, thank you so much, Christopher. Wonderful to talk to you. And hopefully I'll get to London again soon. <laughs> Brilliant. Okay, Thanks thank again. You. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. And thanks to everyone who's tuned in tonight and texted the show. Do check out our other Teachers Talk radio shows this week. Tom Rogers will be on again talking about something particularly important this week. And on Monday, uh, we've got James Radburn's Late Show on EdTech on the 4th of August, which looks like being a critical update on educational innovation of relevance to all classroom teachers. As always, you can catch up on anything you've missed with our excellent and ever-growing panel of teacher presenters at www.ttradio.org. And if you have something you want to say or ask others about education anywhere on planet Earth, then perhaps you should consider applying to join the station as a show host. We are always on the lookout for those with current or recent experience of the classroom and other less familiar educational settings. Full details can be found on our website, www.ttradio.org. That's all from me for this month. So thank you for listening. I wish you a restful and joyful month, and we will speak again in August. Goodbye. It's time for a fresh start to language learning. Pearson Edexcel's new student-centred French, German and Spanish 2024 GCSEs cater to the needs of all learners, regardless of their background, ability or reason for studying. Rooted in learned language knowledge, their assessments are transparent and accessible, allowing all students to showcase their language skills. Through inclusive and relatable content, the new Pearson Edexcel MFL GCSEs build a shared cultural capital that helps students develop an understanding of and appreciation for the wider world. Find out more at go.pearson.com forward slash MFL GCSE 24. You've been listening to Teachers Talk Radio. Tune in live and listen back at ttradio.org. We look forward to hearing from you next time on Teachers Talk Radio.